Making the headlines tonight. U.S. Embassy responds to Prime Minister's request, saying Humanet's West Point degree has already been confirmed since 2019. Prime Minister Hun Sen will deliver donations to Myanmar during his state visit. French President Macron stated he wants to piss off unvaccinated amid rise of Omicron cases in France. And a drone can drop 40,000 seeds a day, more than a million per year, helping to end deforestation in the Amazon forest. This is the Daily Roundup on the EAC News Channel. A very good evening to you. I'm Yuri Matosko. Spokesman for the U.S. Embassy in Cambodia, Chad Rodemeyer, responded to an email from EAC News confirming that the current issue around Humanet's degree had already been explained by West Point Academy in 2019, meaning that the U.S. school does not divide its degrees into level 2 or second class standard or honorary degree status, as oppositional leader Sam Rancy claimed. Chad Rodemeyer confirmed to EAC News that the embassy could not comment on U.S. school diplomas on behalf of educational institutions, but said that in Homanet's case, the issue had already been clarified by West Point Academy in October 2019, when the head of public affairs, Christopher Orfdett, liaison at the West Point American Academy of Sciences, confirmed that allowing international students to study at West Point Academy was an initiative of the State Department and the Department of Defense, and the way they choose to study and train in the military is the same as that of American students. There is no division of Level 2 students or honorary degree students. On Wednesday morning, Prime Minister Hun Sen asked the U.S. Ambassador to Cambodia, Patrick Murphy, to help clarify whether degrees received by Cambodian students from the United States are second class or only of an honorary nature, in order to protect the honor of the education in the United States. He made this request during his speech at the award ceremony for Oxide Moon at the Peace Palace. The Prime Minister's request comes after Sam Rensi made accusations about his son, Homanes, education degrees. ตาบริอาจอาจนึงนิยายบาดได้หรือปัญหาดังท่าสลาเวสต์ปอนด์เหมือนกับรัฐเชียร์สัญญาบัตรประเภทปีหรือสัญญาบัตรเกิดอยู
whom Annette posted another message to Sam Renzi saying to stop doing politics altogether because he did not have the courage to defend his argument and is not giving an example of being a good citizen. Another 337 former Cambodian students who study abroad issue an open letter demanding that oppositional leader Sam Renzi publicly apologize for insulting Humanes' former degree. Previously, a group of Cambodian PhD students had also sent an open letter to Sam Renzi stating that they consider his public statement about Cambodian students receiving only second class or honorary degrees were detrimental to their honor and dignity. EAC News reporter Darshana Gauchan has more. The open letter signed by 337 former students states, We the alumni of the doctoral masters and higher education programs who have graduated abroad express our deepest disappointment and regret to the old politician, someone who has downplayed the quality of the degree we received abroad as second class degree or an honorary degree. The former students write that they consider the public statements of Sam Renzi as highly damaging to their honor and dignity and a refusal to recognize the efforts of all students who travel far away to get an education abroad. They note that many struggle to leave their motherland and study, having to overcome many obstacles in order to be successful in their studies and bring knowledge and skills back to Cambodia to participate in building and developing the country upon their return. The letter also states that Sam Renzi's words can act to discourage many Cambodian students who are preparing to study abroad in the future. The students add that Renzi's statement degrades the assessment of the quality of the education one can receive abroad, as well as degrades the education systems of the foreign countries where many Cambodian students have gone to study and successfully graduated from. For these reasons, the students request that Sam Renzi make a public apology and corrections to his statement in order to set an example for the next generation of politicians. The former students also expressed their full support for the message Hun Manait posted on his Facebook page on 28th December, which asked Sam Renzi to have the courage to come forward and retract his statement while facing the Cambodian students who study both in the country and abroad. Darshana Gochen, EAC News. Prime Minister Hun Sen, as chair of ASEAN 2022, will embark on his official two-day visit to Myanmar on Friday to hold a bilateral meeting with Senior General Ming Ong Leng and seek a solution to the conflict in the country. The Prime Minister will also be delivering a donation of medical materials on behalf of the government and people of the Kingdom of Cambodia to the Republic of the Union of Myanmar to aid in the fight against COVID-19. Prime Minister Hun Sen will be leading a high-level delegation to visit Myanmar on January 7 and 8 at the invitation of Senior General Ming Aung Hlaing to discuss and exchange views on bilateral and multilateral cooperation and recent developments in ASEAN. The Prime Minister has also previously stated that he will be seeking to negotiate a solution to the ongoing crisis in Myanmar. The Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Prak Sokon, the Minister of Industry, Science, Technology and Innovation, Cham Prasid, and a number of senior government officials will be accompanying the Prime Minister on his visit. Additionally, the delegation will be delivering a donation of medical materials on behalf of the royal government and people of Cambodia. The donation comprises of 3 million faces masks, 200,000 N95 masks, 100,000 goggles, 30,000 personal protection equipment, 30,000 face shields, 3,000 safety plastic boots, and 50 units each of ventilators, patient monitors, and oxygen concentrators. In the latest update on the Naga World protests, the Phnom Penh Municipal Court has made the decision to detain Naga World Union leaders Chim Sito and Sok Narit on charges of incitement to commit a crime under Articles 594 and 595 of the Cambodian Penal Code, while another union official, Sok Konkia, has been placed under judicial supervision. The two arrested leaders will be detained at Prey Sai Prison. Previously, six others connected to the Naga World protest had also been arrested on New Year's Eve. EAC News reporter Darshana Gauchan has more details. According to the co-lawyer of all three union leaders, Sam Chamron, after a full day of questioning, 
the Phnom Penh Municipal Court has decided to detain Chum Sito and Sok Narat at Prai Saw Prison for incitement to commit a crime. Additionally, union leader Sok Kong Kia has also been placed under court supervision and was released on bail. Sam Chamran has stated that he considers the decision to charge his clients as too hasty and unfair. He has said that he would be filing a complaint to the investigative chamber of the Court of Appeal to demand that his two clients be released on bail. The Deputy Director for Monitoring at the Cambodian League for the Promotion and Defense of Human Rights, Aim Sam At, has said that the arrest of the three union leaders and their representatives is not a good resolution to the problem between the company, Naga World, and the protesting workers. He added that if authorities continue to arrest protesters, it will be a violation of labor rights and will also act as a violation of basic rights and a threat to advocates of nonviolent protest. Naga World Workers Union members have been involved in close to three weeks of strikes and protests over the termination of more than 1,300 Naga World workers last year due to disruptions by the COVID-19 pandemic. On Tuesday, the Phnom Penh police held a press conference on the arrest of six protesting union members on New Year's Eve, presenting evidence of financial reports, voicemails, and plans from foreign and domestic organizations supporting the organization of the protests, which the municipal court has determined as enough evidence to detain the union leaders and proceed with further legal proceedings. The court has so far decided to charge a total of nine protesters for causing disturbances to Social Security under Articles 494 and 495 of the Penal Code of the Kingdom of Cambodia. A total of 119 civil society groups issued a five-page statement on Tuesday evening, expressing their deep disappointment with the actions and decision of the Phnom Penh Municipal Police to detain the union leaders, negotiators, and union activists who support the labor rights of the Naga world workers of the company. The Australian Embassy in Cambodia has also released a short statement on its official Facebook page saying that people have the right to peaceful assembly and freedom of expression, and we encourage all parties to return to negotiations in pursuit of a swift and peaceful resolution. The U.S. Embassy to Cambodia has also posted a message on its Facebook page stating that the embassy was closely monitoring the arrests of union members for their peaceful expression and urge authorities to hear citizens not silence them. The embassy concluded its statement by saying that freedoms of speech, assembly, and association are guaranteed in the Cambodian constitution. Naga world workers continue to protest in front of the casino in Daun Pen district, Phnom Penh, to demand that the company respect labor laws and accept them back to work and also pay them the appropriate compensation. Until now, the dispute between the company and the workers has not yet found a resolution, despite mediation from the Phnom Penh administration and the Ministry of Labor. Darshana Gochen, EAC News. The Ministry of Posts and Telecommunication launched the Digital Government Cooperation Center, known as DGCC, which plays an important role in building policy and capacity of digital government cooperation. Minister of Posts and Telecommunication Chia Vended presided the launching ceremony along with Korean Ambassador to Cambodia, Park Kwang Kyun. Representatives of the Korea International Cooperation Agency Cambodia office, as well as relevant officials, were also present at the launching ceremony. The Digital Government Cooperation Center was constructed for supporting joint Cambodia-Korea digital cooperation projects, as well as providing policy advice and capacity building, especially for sharing Korean digital government experience through events, digital government forums and workshops. The DGCC project is part of the support for the implementation of the Cambodian Digital Government Policy 2022-2035. It's part of the royal government efforts to build a smart administration based on the use of digital technologies for modernizing the governance system and creating a conducive environment to boost an inclusive digital economy and society. The new academic year of the general education in Cambodia will kick off on Monday, 10 of January. On the occasion of the award ceremony for Cambodian Petanque gold medalist Oak Seremum, Prime Minister Hun Sen has announced kindergartens with children from 3 to 5 years old are allowed to reopen. EAC News reporter Kong Sedepo has more. 
At the Peace Palace this Wednesday morning, Prime Minister Hun Sen announced the reopening of all kindergartens thanks to the high level of herd immunity against COVID-19 in the kingdom. It's another step to ensure the country is fully reopened and distancing itself from the hardship of the 20 February community transmission, which has lasted 10 months ending on 20 of December. The Prime Minister has also stated that such decision will allow not only for pupil to be in class and learn how to social life with teachers and college, but will also give more freedom for parents to work and earn more income. According to the Prime Minister, around 3 million students are going to start the academic year next week. Cambodia announced the closure of the school across the country, including kindergarten, on 16 March 2020. Currently, Cambodia achieved 101.57 percent vaccination of the population 80 and over, 99.15 percent of 12 to 17 years old, and 105.30 of the age of 6 to 11 years old. Kung Srepo, EAC News. The Minister of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, Prak Sokhon, delivered the 23rd ASEAN Lecture ASEAN Chairmanship 2022 via video conference on Monday at the invitation of ISEAS Yusof Ishak Institute in Singapore. During the lecture, the former minister spoke about Cambodia's choice to steer ASEAN 2022 under the theme of ASEAN ACT, addressing challenges together and emphasized the importance of ASEAN spirit as a united family of 10. He has also answered some questions to those attending the online lecture and spoke particularly at length about the situation in Myanmar. While speaking at a lecture program hosted by the ISEAS, Yusof Ishak Institute in Singapore on Monday, Deputy Prime Minister Prak Sokhon answered some questions regarding Myanmar and Cambodian's decision to focus on helping resolve the crisis in the country as the year's Asian chair. He said that after the royal government announced Prime Minister Hun Sen will be making an official state visit to Myanmar, Cambodian has been facing certain threats such as a recent bombing near the Cambodian embassy in Yangon and online posts of threats and insults to the royal government of Cambodia. He continued that Cambodia does not seek any political, economic or strategic gain from its actions with Myanmar and the kingdom is only interested in helping Myanmar rise out of civil war, tragedy and suffering, which Cambodia has experienced in the past. The foreign minister said the situation in Myanmar is very complex because of the country's political history, political culture, and the militant dominant role of the 70 years. He added that last year the situation in Myanmar caused concern for the region, especially ASEAN, due to the one country humanitarian crisis, the two governments, the people's failure to comply with their guerrilla warfare orders being waged around the country, which affected regional stability. He continued that despite the many efforts of ASEAN and especially the special envoy of the chair for Myanmar, a solution to the crisis still has not come to light, hence, Cambodian is giving special focus to this issue as ASEAN chair. He stressed the need to provide humanitarian assistance to those most in need in Myanmar in connections with the five points consensus on Myanmar that ASEAN issued in the past, which calls for an end to the violence, the establishment of a multilateral dialogue, the coordination of ASEAN special envoys, the provision of humanitarian assistance, and the granting of special envoys to visit Myanmar. The crisis in Myanmar stems from the military coup that took place on 1st February 2021, which saw the arrest of State Councillor Aung San Suu Kyi, President Wing Ming, and other ruling party officials by the Myanmar Armed Forces, who refused to recognize the results of the November 2020 election and handed over the leadership of the country to the commander-in-chief of the National Army, Ming Ong Lang. Prime Minister Hun Sen, as the chair of ASEAN in 2022, will pay a visit to Myanmar on the 7th and 8th of January to help find a solution to the ongoing crisis. The Minister of Public Works and Transport is in discussions with the National Police Commissioner of the Ministry of Interior to promote the establishment of a telegram group used for people to report traffic accidents. The discussion comes after Prime Minister Hun Sen's speech at the award ceremony of Petanki gold medalist Ug Mom, instructing the Minister of Public Works and Transport to create such group in order to control and prevent road accidents. 
EAC News reporter Darshana Gauchan has information. Prime Minister Hun Sen has instructed the Minister of Public Works and Transport, Sun Chantol, to hold talks with Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Interior, Sa King, to establish a free telegram system for the public. The group chat will be used for updating information on road traffic conditions such as accidents and violations of road traffic laws. The meeting has also issued the review of the program of deducting and adding points on driver's licenses, the reporting on the strategy of electric vehicles, the progress of public service centers, the drafting of the roadmap network, and preparations for the ministry meeting. On this occasion, Senior Minister Sun Chantol said that the ministry is having discussions with the National Police Commissioner General of the Ministry of Interior to promote the mechanism of using the telegram system to be able to operate sustainably and maturely, making it easier for people to use. He added that the ministry is also examining the possibility of incorporating some automated apps and mechanisms to make the management of data transmission and reception easier for relevant officers and policemen to manage and have data to create strategic plans. Darshana Gochen, EAC News. Cambodian study of Omicron variant infection has surpassed 100 cases. 18 new COVID-19 cases related to Omicron has been detected overnight. All of the cases were imported. There have been 11 patients' recoveries and one more day with no deaths being reported. Cambodia's COVID-19 case tally has now climbed to 120,553. The death toll is stands at 3,015. The number of patients treated successfully since the pandemic reached Cambodia is 116,982 and case tally imported has climbed to 19,969. Currently, 556 patients are still being treated in treatment centers across the kingdom. French President Emmanuel Macron has said on Tuesday that he wanted to piss off the non-vaccinated in a slang, cutting remark that prompted howls of condemnation from opposition rival less than four months before the next presidential election. France last year put in place a health pass that prevents people without a PCR test or proof of vaccination to enter restaurants, cafes, and other venues. The government wants to turn it into a vaccine passport that means only the vaccinated can have a health pass. The president was quoted as saying, the unvaccinated, I really want to piss them off. And so, we are going to continue doing so until the end. That's the strategy. He has added, I won't send a vaccinated to prison I won't vaccinate it by force, so we need to tell them from January 15, you won't be able to go to the restaurant anymore, you won't be able to have a coffee, go to the theater, the cinema. Macron has been criticized in the past for off-the-cuff remarks which many French people have said came across as arrogant, cutting, or scornful. He has later expressed remorse on several occasions. Right-wing presidential candidate Valérie Pécresse says that she was outraged by the president's comments. She was outraged by his comments, but that's not all he said. He also meant that unvaccinated are not citizens, and it's not up to the president to pick up and choose who among the French are good or bad. They have to be accepted as they are, and they should be governed and united without being insulted. As leader, there is a need and courage to tell the truth, but insults are never the right solution and we must end this presidential mandate of this day. Infectious diseases expert Eric Combs has announced on Wednesday that a part of him understood Macron's frustration with the unvaccinated, but that he remained a bit surprised. He has explained that, as doctors, they also express a certain exasperation with regard to the unvaccinated and went beyond what was in our head. COVID-19 vaccines produced by China's Sinopharm and Sinovac can offer protection against severe illness, hospitalization, and death related to the Omicron variant, a World Health Organization official has said on Tuesday. WHO incident manager Abdi Muhammad has also stated that more evidence is emerging that Omicron is affecting the upper respiratory tract, causing milder symptoms than previous variants. China's Sinopharm and Sinovac have been said to offer protection against severe disease. 
While Omicron seems to be slipping past antibodies, evidence is emerging that current COVID-19 vaccines still provide some protection against the variant by eliciting a second pillar of the immune response from the T-cells, according to WHO Incident Manager Abdi Muhammad. We have seen right now is what's going to protect from severe hospitalization and death is your T-cell response. So the neutralization antibodies go down and is the T-cells. And what we know from other vaccines, they do prevent, whether it's Sinovac, Sinopharm, the studies done in Chile and other places have shown that they really work against severe hospitalization. So the vaccines had different uh, ranking in terms of prevention of infection, but what we know very well so far is all of them prevent that. So it's too early to say when uh, majority countries use another vaccines, how that, but our prediction is that the protection against severe hospitalization and death will be maintained. Sinovac's CoronaVac and state-owned Sinopharm's BBIBP Core V vaccine are the two most used vaccines in China and the leading COVID-19 shots exported by the country. More evidence is emerging that Omicron is affecting the upper respiratory tract, causing milder symptoms than previous variants, which would cause severe pneumonia, Mohammed noted. This may be good news, but more research is still needed to confirm it, he added. He warned that Omicron would become a dominant strain within weeks in many places due to its high transmissibility, posing a threat to medical systems in countries and regions where a high proportion of the population remains unvaccinated. Asked about whether an Omicron-specific vaccine was needed, Mohammed said it was too early to say, but he had voiced doubts and stressed that the decision required global coordination and should not be left to manufacturers to decide alone. Since the heavily mutated variant was first detected in November in South Africa, WHO data shows it has spread quickly and emerged in at least 128 countries and regions. Meanwhile, more evidence is emerging that the Omicron coronavirus variant is affecting the upper respiratory tract, causing milder symptoms than previous variants. World Health Organization's incident manager Abdi Mohammed has announced on Tuesday that they say more and more studies point out that Omicron is infecting the upper part of the body, which could be good news, unlike the other variants which cause severe pneumonia. However, he added that Omicron's high transmissibility means it will become dominant within weeks in many places, posing a threat in countries where a high portion of the population remains unvaccinated. North Korea has fired a suspected ballistic missile off its east coast on Wednesday. Authorities in Japan and South Korea have confirmed, underscoring leader Kim Jong-un's New Year vow to bolster the military to counter an unstable international situation. Japan's Coast Guard, which first reported the launch, has said it could be a ballistic missile, but did not provide further details. The launch is the first this year for the nuclear-armed nation. Since last year, North Korea has repeatedly launched missiles, which is very regrettable, Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida has told reporters. Defense Minister Nobuo Kishi has told reporters the suspected missile had flown for about 500 kilometers and landed outside Japan's exclusive economic zone. South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff have said that the missile was launched eastward at about 8 a.m. on Wednesday from a land-based platform, according to the Yonhap News Agency. The test comes days after the conclusion of a key party meeting in North Korea that focused mainly on the pandemic hit economy, although leader Kim Jong-un has promised to continue to bolster the country's defense but did not specifically mention weaponry. The country has continued test firing new short-range ballistic missiles, including one launched from a submarine in October. Now for a look at news making international headlines this Thursday, 6 January. At least 13 people, including 7 children, were killed in an early morning fire on Wednesday, 5th of January in a Philadelphia apartment building after smoke detectors has failed to go off, the Philadelphia Fire Department has announced. 
Firefighters have arrived around 6.40 a.m. and fought for about 15 minutes to control the blaze on the second floor of the three-story row house in the city's Fairmont neighborhood owned by the city's public housing authority. Eight people have managed to escape the building through one of the two exits, and seven children were among those killed. Philadelphia Deputy Fire Commissioner Craig Murphy told reporters at a news conference, officials did not give the children's ages. Fire officials have said the death count could change. Nearby, fire trucks were still parked outside the red brick building, its facade blackened, its windows smashed out and dark. A child and an adult were taken by paramedics to nearby hospitals. There were four smoke detectors in the building, but they failed to activate, fire officials said. There were conflicting accounts as to when the smoke detectors were last inspected. The fire department has said they were last inspected in 2020. The executive vice president at the Philadelphia Housing Authority, Dinesh Indala, has told reporters the last annual inspection was in May 2021. He has stated there were six functioning detectors at the time of the May inspection, not four. He said he did not know why the detectors did not go off. The building was converted to house two families, Indala has confirmed, and 26 people lived in the building. Kazakh police have used flash grenades as hundreds of protesters have tried to storm the mayor's office in the country's biggest city, Almaty, in the early hours of Wednesday, the 5th of January. Police have removed hundreds of protesters from the city's main square using tear gas and flash grenades. A witness has recalled there were a series of explosions in the vicinity of the city's main square where the mayor's office is located. Kazakh President Kasim Jomart Tokayev has declared a two-week state of emergency in the Central Asian nation's biggest city, Almaty, and in the western Majinstal province, both of which have become scenes of mass protests. Protests have erupted in several Kazakh cities and towns after the authorities have lifted price caps on liquefied petroleum gas, a popular car fuel, allowing prices to surge. A soldier peers over the top of a trench as the snow falls thickly over the surrounding field near the village of Kremsky in eastern Ukraine. This is the front line of Ukraine's war against Russian-backed forces in the Luhansk region. Russian troops' movements near Ukraine's borders have alarmed Kiev and its western allies in recent weeks. Through the soldiers here say they are ready for any escalation from Russia. One soldier says that they are determined to stand firm and they will not give up their country. They fought for the independence for a long time. The soldier named Martin has added, he doesn't plan to stay there forever. He plans to repel any Russian attack and come back home so that his daughter will later say, wow, father, you managed to stop superpower with your own hands. U.S. officials have warned Russia might launch an attack against Ukraine as early as the second half of January, when the ground will be harder, making it easier for tanks and other armor to move swiftly. Russia has demanded security guarantees it wants from the West in order to defuse the current crisis. Moscow denies it is planning a new military offensive and accuses Kiev of building up its own forces in the east of the country. After the break, a look at the latest sports news.
EAC News' audience is growing. Our YouTube channel has over 150,000 verified subscribers. To mark the milestone, we've received the Silver Creator Award from YouTube. It's given to channels with over 100,000 subscribers. YouTube CEO Susan Wojcicki says the award celebrates EAC News' hard work and incredible achievement. She says we've brought a unique voice and style to the world, but have also created valuable connections and built a community along the way. The next milestone we're going for is 1 million subscribers, and we'd really like that Gold Creator Award. So if you're not already a subscriber, head to YouTube and search for EAC News. Subscribers get alerts when the Daily Roundup is premiering and live events are streaming. Get all the latest breaking news and updates from Cambodia in English. The EAC News channel on YouTube. Cambodia made clear. If it's happening and you need to know about it, you'll get it all right here. EAC News brings you updates and breaking news in English across all of our platforms and channels. The EAC News app, YouTube, Facebook, Telegram, Twitter, and our website, www.eacnews.asia. Join me, Andrew Barnes-Roberts, and the rest of the EAC News team every day on your favorite channels. EAC News, Cambodia made clear. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison has made a speech on Thursday morning saying Novak Djokovic failed to provide sufficient proof to receive a medical exemption to enter Australia. Australian Border Force on Thursday cancelled the visa of Djokovic, the world number one tennis player, and denied him entry into the country to play in the Australian Open tournament after he was forced to wait for several hours at Melbourne Airport. In a dramatic series of events, through the Melbourne night, Djokovic touched down at Tula Marine Airport Wednesday about 11.30 p.m. local time after a 14-hour flight from Dubai, but was ushered into an isolation room under police guard when Australian officials said his visa did not allow for medical exemptions. Rules are rules. And there are no special cases. Rules are rules. It's what I said to you yesterday. Uh, that's the policy of the government and has been our government's strong border protection policies, and particularly in relation to the pandemic, that has ensured that Australia has one of the lowest death rates from COVID anywhere in the world. And I want to thank the Australian Border Force officers for doing their job, implementing the government's policy. And uh, the ABF has done their job. Entry with a visa requires double vaccination or a medical exemption. Um, I'm advised that such an exemption was not in place, and as a result, he is subject to the same rule as anyone else. That ultimately, this is the responsibility of the traveller. It is for the traveller to be able to assert and back up their ability to come into the country consistent with our laws. So they'll take advice from many places. Um, no advice was provided by the Commonwealth Government, I underscore. But they will take advice, but it's up to them at the end of the day. And uh, if they don't comply with the rules, then the Australian Border Force will do their job, and they have done their job. Um, this is nothing about any one individual. It is simply a matter of following the rules. And, uh, and so those processes will take uh, their course um, uh, over the next few hours, and, and, uh, and uh, that, that event will play out as it, as it should. People try to run the border all the time, by the way. You know, people come with a visa but may not satisfy other requirements for entry. Um, and people are put on planes uh, and turned back all the time. Um, anybody who's watched uh, the Border Patrol shows will understand that. This is not an irregular act thing to happen if someone is put on a plane and, and told to return to their country, even if they may have come with a valid visa. Um, a visa um, is one issue, but you have to have a double vaccination because that's the country's rule for entry into the country, and that is assessed at the border. And we don't have border force officers in every airport around the country. 
and uh, he provided information uh, to the airline to allow his entry onto the plane. But people get on that plane. Um, that is not an assurance that they'll be able to come through Australia's border at the other side. It wasn't a problem ne necessarily with the visa. Um, there are many visas granted. Um, and if you have a visa and you're double vaccinated, well, you're very, very welcome to come. And I think this what this says to everybody in Australia. People are welcome in Australia. But if you're not double vaccinated and you're not an Australian resident or citizen, well, you can't come. <laughs> And many countries have those rules around the world, and we have them, and they've been very important for securing Australia during the course of this pandemic. And so it, it is on them to have uh, the proof um, to show why they wouldn't have to be vaccinated. Now, he was unable to furnish that proof to the Border Force officers um, uh, at the airport last night, and they're the rules, and it happens many, on many occasions, and that's what's now happened. So there is no suggestion of, of any um, particular uh, position in relation to Serbia. In fact, Serbia has been a, a very good friend of Australia and provided very strong support, particularly on, on security issues globally, and we greatly appreciate that. Um, so this is a very specific case that deals with one individual, um, uh, Australia's sovereign border laws and their fair application. Um, I, it is not appropriate for me to go into Mr Djokovic's own medical history. That would not be a fair thing for us to do. That is, they are matters for him uh, to discuss in terms of his own medical history. Uh, but what I, all I can say is that the uh, evidence for medical exemption that was provided was found to be insufficient. Serbian President Aleksandr Vucic said the country has offered its support to tennis world number one Novak Djokovic. In his Twitter account, the Serbian president declared, I told our Novak that the whole of Serbia is with him and that our bodies are doing everything to see that the harassment of the world's best tennis player is brought to an end immediately. On Tuesday, Djokovic has said he has initially been granted a medical exemption from the country's COVID-19 vaccination requirements so that he could play in the Australian Open. Arriving in Australia, however, things turn out differently. With a month to go before the start of the Beijing Winter Olympics, Chinese President Xi Jinping visited a Games venue and inspected ongoing preparations for the 2022 Olympic and Paralympic Winter Games. The 2022 Games, which open on February the 4th, are set to take place as the world grapples with the highly transmissible Omicron variant Although China, which has a zero-tolerance COVID-19 policy, reported a handful of Omicron cases. Organizers said on Wednesday that a closed-loop bubble, in which participants can only leave if they are exiting the country or undergoing quarantine, was activated as planned on Tuesday. The loop restricts games-related personnel to certain zones in and around Olympics venues to avoid any contact and risk of transmission with the local population. Overseas participants will fly directly into and out of the closed loop. More than 2,000 international athletes are set to come to China for the Games, plus 25,000 other stakeholders, a large number from overseas. Organizers did not say how many of those people would be in the closed loop. Former two-time unified world heavyweight champion, Britain's Anthony Joshua, said he's looking forward to his next boxing bout against Alexander Yusik and is confident of redeeming himself after being beaten by the Ukrainian in an anonymous points decision loss last September. Speaking at Expo 2020 Dubai, the former two-time unified world heavyweight champion also conceded that the second loss of his career hurt the most and that he was simply beaten by the better fighter on the night. Joshua, who is expected to face Yuzik for a second time in either March or April, having triggered his rematch clause last October, defiantly weighted in on where he sees himself in the current heavyweight picture among the likes of Yuzik, Tyson Fury and Deontay Wilder. 
Yeah, definitely, definitely. Fully motivated. Fully motivated. I'm normally someone that looks at the positive, but there ain't no point. I need to right that wrong. That's it. Let me not complicate it. Right the wrong, get back on the gravy chain. Then it's a fight I know I can win. It's a fight he probably knows he can win. You know, he fought that in the first place. I fought that in the first place. He got the better of me. I'm going to come back. Trust me, we're going, we're going for it. I'm looking forward to it. When I lost the first time, as I said, I never made no excuses. But I have my reason, and I, and I always felt like a call. Cool. You know, I took my loss, but I, I'll get it back. I knew I'll get it back. So I just brushed that. But this one hurt because I was 100%, no problems, everything was cool. Went in there and I just lost to the better man that night and it hurt, but it gave me motivation to pull myself out of that position where mentally it killed me and I fought my way back and um, I redeemed myself. For me, you know, I took my loss. I'm not saying I'm bad, but I'm a good fighter and I came up against another good fighter and it just went my night and we bounced back. So I tell people now, when I see sometimes the reaction of people, I wish they were stronger mentally because one loss doesn't mean you should stop. Ten losses doesn't mean you should stop. You never know when your greatness is around the corner. And if I stop today because it's like, oh, I've lost twice, I'm not as good as I thought I was, I'll never be able to fully know how far I could have taken this. So that's what I use this as a motivation for is, you know what, even though I've lost, what else is out there waiting for me? So I look at some of the other fighters and I look back at their career and I think, when did they, when did they grow up here and start fighting people? They weren't always that brave. Everything we see of certain fighters today, look back at them and that's why I don't believe what they talk about because I've, I've studied these guys. They're not true warriors. A true warrior is a warrior from the start. They're not built. And for me, I went straight in the deep end ever since I come in boxing. So I just want to be remembered for someone who was willing, a true warrior and I fought everyone. Now for a look at how the weather is going to be playing for tomorrow. And finally, an Australian biotech startup say their drones can combat deforestation by planting millions of trees a year from the air. And this is perfect to solve the problem of deforestation in Brazil's Amazon rainforest, which hit its highest level in over 15 years. According to the latest data, some 13,000 square kilometers was lost during the 2020-2021 period. AirSeed Technology wants to fight climate change and biodiversity loss by combining drone technology, artificial intelligence, and their special seed pods designed to be fired into the ground from the air. According to CEO and co-founder of AirSeed Technologies, Andrew Walker, each drone can plant over 40,000 seed pods per day, and the drones fly autonomously. In comparison to traditional methodologies, that's 25 times faster and also 80% cheaper. So Mercy Technologies is an environmental restoration company that combines some really awesome technology, so drone technology, software and hardware, uh, to really deliver a hyper-productive planting solution for the environmental space. Um, and we balance that also with some really innovative biotech, which really supports the seeds once they're on the ground and allows them to um, support them beyond germination, emergence, and early stage growth. Uh, each of our drones can plant uh, over 40,000 seed pods uh, per day, uh, and they fly autonomously. Um, and uh, you know, in comparison to traditional methodologies, um, that's sort of 25 times faster, uh, but also 80% um, cheaper. So that really allows um, the adoption of more 
carbon mitigation, biodiversity loss um, projects to, to be undertaken, um, which, which is, is what we really need to do if we are going to sort of you know, start reducing and, and draw down the emissions that we've, uh, we've caused over the course of the last 30, 40 years. So RST Technologies uses uh, machine learning for uh, identifying the, the, the best locations to plant but also for identifying uh, specific plant species, uh, specifically weed types, um, which could be invasive and combative to the, to the plants that we actually plant. Uh, and we can identify them using different types of uh, remote sensing and, uh, and drone tech. And then we analyze those, uh, that data through machine learning so that we can, we know what we need to go and address uh, in the field um, uh, quickly to make sure that we have the, the maximum um, success in our projects. The new technology can deliver thousands of seed pods to the ground every hour. It will tackle large-scale restoration projects, but the niche element of this technology really lies in the biotech, which is the support system for the seeds once they hit the ground. It protects the seed from different types of combative elements of wildlife ingress, but also supports the seed once it germinates and really helps deliver all of those nutrients and mineral sources that it needs, along with some probiotics to really boost early stage growth. Air Seed Technology will manufacture these seed pods in what it calls a mobile manufacturing plant. The solution has been designed with global scale and rapid response in mind. The seeds are chosen for the terrain to be planted and the pods manufactured locally using waste biomass, providing a carbon-rich coating that protects seeds from birds, insects, and rodents. The drones autonomously fly pre-programmed flight paths, planting a predefined pattern and recording each seed's coordinates, which allows the route to be surveyed later to assess the health of the trees. Air Seed Technologies says it has already planted more than 50,000 trees in South Africa and Australia and aims to plant 100 million trees by 2024. The United Nations Environment Program says the world loses around 7 million hectares of forest every year, an area equal to the size of Portugal. Thanks for watching the Daily Roundup here on the EAC News Channel. For more breaking news and updates, check our website eacnews.asia. You can also search for EAC News on your Telegram or in your favorite app store. More from the EAC News team tomorrow at 8 p.m. I will see you then.